In this last segment, we're going to ask, what can governments do? What have we learned from security economics that might be useful to the policymaker? Well, we've seen that many information security problems result from market failures, and where markets fail because of externalities, governments can use regulations or taxes to try and put things right. For example, motor vehicles create pollution, CO2, um, oxides of nitrogen and so on, and so most governments impose fuel taxes to try and put that cost back on the motorist. Second, if there's asymmetric information, governments can fix that by finding out the information and publishing it. So we see, for example, that many governments force car vendors to publish fuel usage statistics that are collected according to specified methodologies. So far, so good. But what options are there for information policy? Well, we've seen that many of the problems with information come from the fact that monopolies are pervasive because of network effects. Now, most countries have got competition laws, but they tend not to prohibit all monopolies, but rather just restrict their abuse. For example, in the European Union, um, it's illegal to use a monopoly in one field to create another monopoly in a nearby field. An example uh, is what happened with Microsoft and Netscape, where back in the mid-1990s, Microsoft used its dominance of the PC platform to drive Netscape out of business and replace Netscape as the dominant browser with Internet Explorer. Now, the European Union did in the end take enforcement action, but it took them 15 years um, with dragging through one court case after another before they finally compelled Microsoft to offer European users a randomized choice of browser and startup. So regulation can work, but it takes a long time. So what other um, security policy goals might we have? Well, we can try and improve enforcement. And there are various moves to get police forces to share information better to pursue cyber criminals are often transnational. We can also try to measure risk and harm better. And there are various things that we'll discuss that are being uh, done in, in that field. And we can also try to assign responsibility for failures in ways that are more incentive compatible. So let's start working down through that list. And the big win, as uh, Tyler Moore pointed out, was in California, where they um, introduced the first security breach reporting law, which has since been followed by most US states and some other countries. This at least means that if your information is stolen, the person from whom it was stolen has to tell you about it so that you can do something about it. And this also helps to fix the market because people can see which firms are good or not so good at keeping hold of their um, personal information. Now, in the European Union, we already did this for telecoms. Now, unfortunately, the new directive on network and information security is going to mandate reporting of breaches and vulnerabilities to governments instead, because government agencies want to know who's hacking who um, for strategic reasons, and they're going to use that for national security rather than for our benefit. So that's, from the consumer's point of view, not as good an outcome. As for externalities, well, as we mentioned, we can try regulation, but that's hard because governments are so much slower than tech companies. We can subsidize research or clean up, and that's done to some extent, particularly research where um, governments in America and Europe spend tens of millions of dollars a year subsidizing security researchers. Or we can try to make firms liable. Now, we could tackle platform vendors such as uh, Microsoft and Apple, we could tackle intermediaries such as internet service providers or the credit card companies who handle the money. Or you could um, tackle the end service providers, the merchants, banks, etc., who are actually selling some service um, over the internet. Now, the first possibility, tackling the software firms, is difficult because right from the beginning of the software industry, companies have traditionally disclaimed all liability. You're surely all familiar with all the don't sue us buttons that you've got to click in order to do anything online or with consumer electronic devices. There are some limits, though, in both the EU and the USA. In Europe, the Product Liability Directive says that you can't disclaim liability for death or injury. But, you know, that's a relatively um, distant prospect for most systems. In practice, this doesn't uh, limit the company's style very much. The next possibility is that you tackle intermediaries such as ISPs or Visa and MasterCard and they too fight really, really hard to escape liability and they've got powerful lobbies uh, just as the software industry have. 
Now, as we saw from Michelle van Etten's lecture, um, ISPs can help uh, because if they put serious effort into cleaning up infected machines, that can cut by two orders of magnitude the amount of spam coming from their systems. And as time goes on, there's more and more pressure being brought on ISPs uh, to clean up things like sex, abu sex abuse images, um, copyright infringing material, and um, there's pressure also on the credit card companies to not process payments to illegal gambling sites and to organisations like WikiLeaks, of which governments disapprove. So the precedent has been set that pressure is going to be put on intermediaries and over time we'll see more and more pressure. But this is likely to be pressure in favour of particular vocal lobby groups like Hollywood rather than pressure which will be applied directly to protect consumers. Consumers are likely going to have to look to the final service providers, such as the bank, which actually takes money out of your account when they think they've been instructed to on your behalf by some website. And in fact, when things go wrong online, very often how that affects you personally is that you see a credit card transaction or a bank debit that you don't recognise. Now, where the regulators allow, banks try and push the costs of fraud onto merchants and customers, but here there's some interesting diversity in practice and we can see direct effects of policy. So in countries like Britain and Spain and Latvia with poor consumer protection, uh, we find that our countries become less attractive places to do online business than countries like the Netherlands or Finland or the USA where there is good consumer protection because where consumer protection is, 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 is of high quality, people have the confidence to bank and shop online and that really matters. So there's some chance uh, that we can overcome selfish and short-sighted lobbying by people like banks and push consumer protection in the right direction. As for privacy as a general issue, um, there are two interestingly different views here. In America, the move is to regulate data use and there are particular bills such as HIPAA, which protects health information, and the BART bill, which protects video rentals. In the European Union, we regulate collection and storage too. And where the difference in philosophy comes is that in America, the Presidential Council of Advisors in Science and Technology uh, recommended in 2014 that cloud systems require the former approach, that is, the US approach. So there should be no restrictions on collecting data or on storing it and indeed running analytics on it. There should just simply be regulations on use. The EU data protection regime is absolutely against this and believes that there must be regulations on collection too, in that the collection of some types of information, sensitive information such as health, uh, religious beliefs, trade union membership and so on, is ipso facto deserving of protection. And also that if you are an intermediary, um, which can put together lots of non-sensitive information in order to derive sensitive facts, then that too has to be open to regulation, otherwise data protection has no meaning. And right now the new data protection regulation is the subject of a huge tussle between the European Parliament and the Commission and the Council, and we'll have to wait and see what comes out of that. Finally, there's the issue of surveillance, and the revelations by Edward Snowden about what the intelligence agencies get up to I've not only shown that quite a number of um, shocking things went on, but also that the scale of networking and sharing between different intelligence agencies was very much larger than anybody thought. Back in the 1980s, for example, um, India would buy its warplanes from Russia, even though it was a democracy, uh, because the lock-in wasn't that great. It was just spare parts and pilot training. But nowadays, India shares information with the NSA rather than with the FSB because the NSA has got the bigger network. And it's not just the five obvious members of the NSA's network um, that are sharing information that get collected through it. Um, it's perhaps 35 or perhaps 65 countries, depending on how you look at it. And um, you also see things like high fixed costs and low marginal costs of modern intelligence and war fighting operations. And the policy implications of this certainly bear some thinking about. Anyway, in summary, in the world that we live in, software is finding its way everywhere. Within a few years, just about everything that you buy for more than 10 bucks and that you don't eat and drink 
will have a CPU in it and will communicate to some cloud service or another. And so the attributes of software will become pervasive too. You'll have the good, the bad and the ugly. The good is that once you've got millions of devices out there that can run apps, if you've got a new idea for an app, you can have your app running at scale quickly and you can suddenly have a successful business. It's good for innovation. The bad is feature writers because people add apps and features, you know, until devices get so frustrating that you want to throw them against the wall. And of course, the ugly is monopolies and everything that flows from that, from consumer exploitation to violations of privacy. And one of the big questions that's going to be facing us as a society over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years is this. How will law and policy evolve to cope?